Hello and welcome to the Emerging Threats and How to Stay Ahead of Them webinar. Uh, in the next 45 minutes or so, we are going to discuss about how to estimate the threat landscape, uh, how we estimate the threat landscape, the chains, and uh, how, how, what would should the organization do to mitigate those threats. Um, we have gathered a group of specialists here today with me, uh, coming from a little bit different backgrounds. Um, whenever I get my slide just saying uh, now. And uh, if we start from introduction, um, I'm Pietra Sarakivi, I'm your host today. And uh, I'm a long time Nixon. I have been, been basically working in, in all of the segments that that uh, we in Nixon we do, um, mainly on the defensive side of the cybersecurity blue team things. Um, currently, I'm leading uh, the Nixo labs where we are trying to understand what future brings and uh, and uh, then how Nixo and our customers should be doing to stay ahead of the game. Together with me, I have Antti and Mac, and maybe it's better if I let you guys to do the introductions of yourself. Okay, Let's thank you and welcome. Yeah. Thank you, Pietari, and welcome to all of our guests who are online and to everybody who is watching this later uh, uh, as a recording. So my name is Antti Kurittu. I have a background in law enforcement and national cert work where I was for, for several years. And I uh, came, came to work with Nick, who as the digital forensics and incident response team lead a couple of years ago, and also expanded into threat intelligence. So so. My background is, is mostly well handling incidents in a in a national national setting. So national uh, cybersecurity, as the as as one uh, one of my previous employers was traffic on the National Cybersecurity Center of Finland, and of course with the police working with actual cyber crime. So that's where my perspective comes from. And as uh, the Nixu incident response team lead, we've been working with with a lot of Nixu customers handling their actual real life incidents. Thanks. And I'm Mackenzie Storm, or just Mac for short. Um, some similarity sort of with with MT, but uh, a bit more on the international relations side myself, uh, including degrees in war studies and public policy. Um, from there, I went into a, a career in federal policing. Uh, that was in Canada, where I'm originally from, but now now based in Stockholm. Um, when I did move to Stockholm, I worked again in international relations in the diplomatic arena uh, here. And I've been with Nixu about a year now, working with a, a really great and diverse threat intelligence team. Um, and it's a good place where, you know, my, my background really complements the technical experts that we have. And we, we learn a lot from each other. Thank yeah, you. And I'll have to, have to add that the diversity here is not representative of the whole of Nixu. So we don't have only old ex-cops who don't have any hair so we have other people also i'm not ex-cop although my dad is but, but yeah <laughs> <laughs> well, before we actually start the, the discussing about the, the main topic uh i would like uh to remind all the listeners who are live now to write your questions to the chat uh to the question um box there so we have time to react those so be rather early than than uh, than on the later part we have reserved a couple of minutes time for that that uh discussion and questions there um but hey let's go then to the main topic emerging threat uh uh trends and um and um as we all know the world around us keeps changing and uh, in ever faster pace and 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 it creates new vulnerabilities especially for the digitalizing uh, society and um, at the same time um, of course the the things like anonymous payment and geopolitics and and overall inequality uh, equality, uh, creates kind of possibility for cyber crime and 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 the threat actors no matter if they are kind of money motivated or politically motivated, they are trying to uh, stay ahead of, of us, the defenders. 
for the defender side um the digitalization creates uh, more kind of complex environments uh more automation uh integration it all adds to the game so so the, the environments are ever more more difficult to protect and uh, like many companies uh they don't have kind of so say unlimited uh, resources to defend the mission critical systems and uh, and um, they, many companies also unfortunately lack the, the agility to adapt on on changes quickly enough and the whole point with this discussion here is is to kind of give our our experts opinions uh how you should be able to optimize your defense, what, what type of threats there are coming. And, and like with any other intelligence, we're trying to so they give you time to adapt on those changes and, 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 and react. Um, so so that is the that is the kind of the whole point here. How we have approached this topic is that that um, all of all three of us we have listed five predictions uh, for the emerging threats. And, uh, and then we have uh, gathered the, the materials together and, and basically handpicked three of them that we are going to uh, talk mainly. And all those three, we actually, we, we all selected those same three. And, and if we have time, we are going to go through the, the remaining parts there, at least on a really high level. But let's focus on those, those three things. And then, um, if we start with the supply chain attacks and vulnerabilities, and uh, and if you aren't to start uh, by telling why this thing is important, why did you choose this, and and of course where you why, why this is emerging, what is changing? Yeah, actually, I uh, chose the vulnerability exploits weaponized for targeted attacks, and uh, might say a couple of words about that because. Uh, we saw last summer the Kaseya BSA ransomware attack, where we saw a, a large-scale exploitation of a vulnerability that was uh, found in this remote monitoring and management software package, which uh, was used by several MSPs, for example, and, and a bunch of companies. And that was used to deploy the R Evil, the Revel. I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but it's, it's written with a capital R, capital E, R Evil. Uh, ransomware and, and a lot of companies got uh, inflicted with that so so we saw that that some of these software packages that are are deployed widely and are, are facing the internet when there's a vulnerability there it gets exploited very quickly a lot of people thought that this was a supply chain attack because it was leveraging a, a sort of a similar similar kind of software that we saw with SolarWinds before, which was an actual supply chain attack. But the difference was that in this case, they weren't able to attack the supply chain itself. Instead, they found a vulnerability in, in similar software and were able to attack that. But the end result was was similar to the customers that their their security was compromised. So I'm, I'm also also worried about this supply chain problem, of course, because uh, there's a very much trust placed in the vendors that supply the software and hardware that we use every day and often use to secure our systems. So when when those are compromised, then it's a really big problem because. It's really hard to defend against the things that you're supposed to trust so that you can use them to defend against others. It's like like having your gun turn on you, for example. It's it's a big problem. So any thoughts, Mac or Pietari? Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, the reason I picked this this topic of supply chains is because I think we're kind of only getting started with it. Um, and despite, you know, looking back and having it with us for a little while now. I think it has a lot of room to grow still um, and that, you know, we still haven't found maybe the best solutions to this, you know, some of which can be tough conversations with your suppliers or partners. Um, and while I, I definitely agree that, you know, vulnerabilities can be one way to exploit this, you know, it's also things like ransomware that can get in there and exfiltrate data to then be used later against all the customers that you may have. You know, we've seen that 
uh, earlier, I think in quarter three with Accenture, you know, very, very big company, um, which is still not clear what that impact exactly is. And I think this is an area that attackers are going to be doing more and more with. Um, we've seen in, in the last month, uh, some reporting come out about really notable uh, advanced persistence threat groups, such as uh, APT29, that one's also known as Nobelium, people might have heard of it, and also North Korea's Lazarus Group, also attacking sort of related targets in the IT supply chain. So that could be, you know, resellers or service providers, and just, it really seems like the goal there is not, you know, that one company itself, but all the other the places it reaches to, the other customers they have. Because um, then an attacker can sit back, especially an APT who has the time and resources to, you know, filter through this data and see what they can do with it if there's no no pressure on them time-wise. Um, so, yeah, I think this is a problem that's not going away anytime soon. You know, we've talked about it a lot in our Threat Intel team about, you know, the sort of solutions that we can come up with other than our, our service as it stands to try to help companies maybe when they're acquiring a new company or merging. Because, um, you know, these are high-risk times as well now. And um, yeah, yeah. I've been kind of obsessed with the idea of scalability for for the last few weeks or months, and been thinking about this. This is uh, this is a good point for a criminal to scale their operations just mm -hmm. by infiltrating one point in the supply chain allows them to scale up their their malware delivery and at attack delivery to all the customers of that supply chain. Uh, let's say, well, that provider that they get get infiltrated. So that's that's one one way to look at it. If I if I continue from next point there, uh, what we can do and and uh, and so on. I, actually, I listed this topic uh, for two reasons. Maybe this is kind of a little bit different different um, approach that, that you guys had that that. Um, I see that, that since we are getting more and more integrated in the supply chains, there's more and more automation there. And, and like in earlier times, there has been small and medium businesses, so smaller companies as part of the supply chain. And I expect that that uh, not all of them are does, doesn't have that much resources to actually defend their, their operations, or they might be capable of defending their operations, but doesn't have enough resources to defend the kind of the, 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 their customers. So, so the supply chain, that the owner of, of the productions, their, their uh, environment. Uh, so, so they might be the, the weaker link in the point, which leads me to the kind of benchmarking and, and uh, understanding the risks in the port. Polio. And, and based on, on some studies, Gardner uh, especially, uh, they think that, that um, in the future, the kind of the risk will be one of the main things in the future that, that is kind of measured when you have, when companies are selecting their, their suppliers. And, and if you're an investor or, or a venture capitalist, you, you might be, or, or just, a, just a kind of uh, member of of of, uh, of board, uh, you might be interested to understand what type of risk this this uh, company or this assets or this my portfolio is is holding. So there needs to be some kind of tooling to do the benchmarking and understanding that if, if my supply chain is chain is is in a good shape. Um, of course, there has been things like vendor management and and this kind of. Uh, <laughs> never-ending list of, of, of compliance checks and, and, and so on, but I don't believe that that is going to be the, the, the fix here, but some kind of uh, external benchmarking, especially when you get the new new ones uh, in there and, and having the small and smaller companies in the chain. But um, how about, what do you uh, think that what we can do, what customers can do to, to prevent these type of uh, vulnerabilities, and if we start with Antti again, well, it's an extremely difficult question to answer without without going into specific use cases and trying to find answers there. And I'm not sure I have them even in that case. But at least one one good good option is to, uh, of course, have your network hygiene already 
in place i mean like you have have separated network segments for different things and and don't treat your internal network as trusted so if you have some kind of software that is being used that that you might suspect that at some point might be might be causing you problems maybe uh, give it only a small segment of the network to play around in if that's possible and and things like that. The, the problem with the with the whole supply chain attack is that it's, it's really simple to say that you must secure your supply chain but how do you actually do that that's that's the actual problem there it's like saying that uh, doing a somersault in the air is easy you just some jump and do a somersault in the air it's like okay well that's that's how you do it for sure but how do you actually do it that's that's such a hard question that i'm not i'm not going to go go into providing any ready canned answers to it you so, can jump in here i think you know while by nature this is like a technical problem there doesn't always have to be technical solutions as your first go-to you know so something like you know having necessary backups you know we can also think about things as you know just acknowledging that supply chain attacks are real you know and that they happen in your that could happen within your organization and that this means that you know the risk management uh assessments that you have in place need to be reconsidered to include you know what if this vital uh partner is compromised or what if this uh, singular payment app we use is compromised. You know, I'm thinking here about Coop, the Swedish uh, grocery store that, you know, had to go down for, for a days or a week. And, you know, so would you have a backup for that if that happens, as an example, you know, that maybe that doesn't stop the attack from happening in the first place, but, you know, having those conversations. And I think this is eventually going to go to conversations with partners and suppliers. And I think that's that's quite uncomfortable at this point, but it can be normalized over time. So, you know, if you're going to do business with a company or a customer, there's always questions you ask when you do that, if they're going to become a bigger partner, right? And maybe something that's lacking there now is, okay, well, you know, I, as a company, we employ threat intelligence as a service. We have a soft, we have these sort of things. Well, if I'm going to do business with you, you know, what do you have, you know, and maybe that's a way to go towards, uh, you know, increasing your defenses. Uh, just to make sure that the people that you're doing business with are, are also taking it seriously. Mm. But you run also into the problem of measuring cybersecurity and measuring its maturity in other organizations. So, mm -hmm. so just benchmarking and making sure that the other other party is doing doing what they should be doing. And that can be also extremely difficult. But that doesn't mean that it should be avoided because of that. So you're you're entirely correct. Mm -hmm. Discussion needs to be had, and not all contingencies uh, are are such that it's reasonable to start thinking about backup options it's sometimes just you have to carry the risk and say okay this is a single point of failure but we can't have three different point of sales systems here and even two it might be just too cumbersome to have two and that's going to cause you more trouble than just relying on one and then maybe going offline for a while mm -hmm. if it gets compromised I'm, I yeah. don't know. Him. I'm sure that they've made very careful calculations on this before think, jumping uh, into. Yeah. yeah, I think none of these things that we are discussing doesn't kind of have so the silver bullets that they, otherwise they would not be kind of emerging. Right? They would be just things to have, uh, handle. Uh, I, I believe here that that um, well, <laughs> the vendor man management and, and benchmarking with the with the capabilities, the measurement capabilities that we have is is. So say the only thing that we can do for for the asset owner, so to say, of course, kind of implementing zero trust type of thinking that that you you basically monitor everything and and, and give access to only the places that is needed and, and so on is is helping here a little bit. But of course, kind of you need to you need to still trust your your um, suppliers. But hey, uh, we are. Just, Time for us to move to the second big uh, thing that we listed here, and it's surprise, surprise, ransomware. And let's start with Mac this time. Sure. So, I mean, ransomware is on this list, and it would probably be on any list for the last couple of years because it can be so costly and it's so widespread, and it's certainly commanding a lot of media attention at this point. And um, I remember going back, you know, whether it's a year now or so, seeing this more in the media and, and being happy that, you know, that. Uh, 
the powers that be in the world are starting to take it a little bit more seriously. It, and now it's, you know, now it's hard to tell, you know, what's a big deal and what's not because there's so many reported incidents. But ransomware is, is with us and it's going to stay with us. And I think the question is about where it's going. What form is it going to take? We've seen ransomware actors really evolving to, to meet, um, you know, new defenses or the challenges that are put up against them. We've, we've seen governments starting to fight back and try to take some ransomware actors out of the game. Um, but then others, you know, are quick to adapt what they're doing. So, you know, one example I have here is just the, the new tactic to recruit company insiders, you know, to try to get that access from an employee itself by offering, you know, up to millions of dollars uh, to give them the access they need. Um, but, you know, there, there's other methods too, just by, you know, threatening that, you know, we'll, we'll leak your data if you don't pay us. And then also with increased pressure, we're seeing ransomware actors possibly move towards what I think Anthony will touch on is, you know, uh, not encrypting at all, but I can hand it over there a bit. Yeah, I, I think we've seen 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 uh, the the tactics of ransomware operators change during the years, from the simple simple first wave of attacks, which was uh, high volume, low ransom, down to this big game hunting tech technique where they are are targeting larger companies and making sure that they they understand their financials so that they can have have a some kind of a baseline for their ransom which is now in the tens of millions uh, we've also seen that just encrypting the data is often not enough to convince the companies to pay because well as as ransomware has evolved so have uh, backup methods and disaster recovery methods so they they are getting better every day because companies are increasingly aware of the risk of having access to your data denied from you at any given moment but the confidentiality of the data is still still one of the primary things and that's why why the attackers have moved on towards also ransoming uh, the publicity of the data they've set up these leak sites where they say that they have the company information and this is a double problem for the company because they lose the control of the publicity of the situation when the attackers take it and and put it on a public website that we have compromised this company and we are we are trying to get them to pay and sometimes these companies might get some pressure from their customers also to force them into payment and i think that probably we'll see in the future more of these cases where they'll just skip the cumbersome encryption part and give just steal the data and focus on exfiltrating the data as much of it as possible and then threatening to leak it to the public possibly causing a lot more damage to the company than just temporarily denying them access to their own stuff and yeah, so I think I, that I think, includes, you know, just reputational damage as well. You know, yeah. just what can I pay so you don't tell anyone? <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of moving parts there. There's the intellectual property and then there's the GDPR angle of, of private information getting leaked. And if it's not properly uh, handled, that's another issue. There might be legal liabilities there. And of course, the, the hit on on reputation, although we have seen uh, in some studies that have taken a good look at the stock prices of publicly traded companies that have been hit by ransomware it only causes a dip in the share price for a day or two and after 10 days it tends to return back to normal and may even outperforming the market but that's just of course a limited study and we've also seen examples of ransom cases ending in in total bankruptcy of the company yeah, we should remember too. I think you know we published it in one of our Nixu Threat Landscape reports just on how often if you if you do pay your attacker, how likely it is you will be attacked again. You know, not only because you've shown you're willing to pay, but also because they've they've had a look at the weaknesses you have. So um, you should always remember who you're paying. <laughs> yeah, and then there's the case, of course, that there is not only one ransomware operator, and it's it's not like they have some kind of a. Uh, Alliance. agreement with each other yeah there's there's no honor among thieves in this situation it might be that you have two or three operators abusing the same weaknesses in in security and we've seen well i've read about situations where there have been 
two concurrent ransomware attacks going on, even even by the same operators posing as two different attackers. And then, yeah, and the initial access brokers who often compromise the network and then sell access to the actual ransomware criminals might sell the access to several people. So you never know that if you pay pay once, you might be facing the same situation and having to pay again. So my advice is is never to pay because that finances crime. Yeah. Even though yeah. I understand that it's it's easy to say when not faced the tough decision of of how, what to do. Yeah, I mean, obviously. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, if I, if I if I mention something about the pay, payment payment here, that it seems that people are still paying because because based on the studies, this is going to be like ten times bigger uh, kind of revenue for the for the uh, threat actors uh, within ten years. So so basically basically this is we're talking about hundreds of billions uh, in in few years. So this is going to be quite a large thing, and it's going to be even so large that that was it Forrester who estimated that that one of the top ten cyber insurers were going to drop the business totally during this year. Oh, sorry, during next year, so the starting year, and um, so so the business case for the cyber insurance companies is going to change change as well. But what I wanted to add here is that that although I believe that there's going to be more and more these groups, there's going to be more kind of the attackers are thinking their own return of investment and and therefore kind of recruiting those insiders and and skipping the the encryption as you as you mentioned earlier. But but when it comes to the critical infrastructure providers or so to say OT environments, I think that the locking down the systems in OT or or near to the OT is going to be still quite relevant and even bigger bigger threat all the time so so kind of for the many production lines it doesn't matter if the data gets copied or even published because well it's kind of everything is based on the, the assets that you have and the, 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 the investment that you have made there but uh, but uh, if if there's interruption there it's it's going to be expensive that doesn't of course uh, include let's say the manufacturing or so but but let's say energy generation and, and distribution is it's quite important to keep the systems running so that kind of the good old locking mechanism is, is going to be important there in in the future as well but sorry Mac, i spoke over you um, no it's, it's totally okay we can definitely switch to now maybe what you can what you can do about it and i think i can touch on company insiders a little bit more as i didn't go into that but you know essentially this is where a uh, threat actor and we've seen ransomware actors already doing this attempt to recruit employees that work in your company and uh, offering them you know a sizable amount of money whether it's in bitcoin or cash to give them access and early studies on the show that you know attacks with insider help can be double as costly you know just because of the access that they're able to to give um, and one of the ransomware games we've seen trying to do this is Lockbit 2.0. Um, they've been very active in the last few months. They're they're also the company for any of our Swedish listeners that um, did the attack on Acti Invest uh, in Sweden just in September. Um, and so you know it's definitely something people should be worried about. And I think there's already some good practices that you can put in place to help prevent the risk of this. You know nothing's perfect. You can't sit down every employee you have and interrogate them on their on what they intend to do but you know things like recommended privilege protections you know not just handing out administrator access to anybody who needs it and giving it to them permanently you know a good advice there is that when people need a higher level of access to the network it's temporarily granted and then expires and this way it allows you to really keep track of who has what and that nobody has it just floating around for something they did a year ago um, I can also think myself just of places I've worked where, you know, when an employee leaves, they don't change pin codes or door codes or anything like that because it's just seen as a, an annoyance. But, you know, that's a really good practice as well is, you know, regularly changing these type of things so that people can't just, you know, enter, enter rooms that they shouldn't have access to, especially if they've now left the company. And going a little bit further with company insiders is making sure that when an employee does end their tenure with your company that their accesses are invalidated. You know immediately 
the proper onboarding process. So don't don't leave it for a few days or a few weeks to to take away their key card or invalidate it or close their accounts. You know, make sure you do that sort of stuff right away. Yeah, I think in overall the the kind of user awareness and and user kind of behavior. Um, monitoring for the existing and current users are quite important as as well. The most likely, if someone is, is giving the, those employees money, the amount of money is so huge that it doesn't matter if you are working there or not. But Ant, you have one minute for maximum for this, and then we need to move to the next topic. Yeah, I just wanted to say that that in a lot of companies, the whole company data is public data inside the company, and there's uh, there's not a lot of a uh, lot of limitations put between let's say units and people and and the information flows try to be as free as possible and that's that's often a good idea but uh, from a security standpoint uh, that's that's kind of problematic to have have the entire intellectual property of the company available for the new employee the day one they walk in the door so maybe maybe some internal restrictions are they might feel rude and they might feel like they're slowing down actually development but with with a robust uh, needs-based approach towards access to data you can safeguard some of that stuff even from a rogue insider mm. yes you're right and, and of course the good all managed detection and response type of protection detection response circle that you need to just get, make sure that, that if someone is in you react quickly enough Let's move to the third topic uh, that is kind of the, the category is called social engineering, but I think there's quite many different things in here. And if you want to start with this. Yeah, uh, well, this this is kind of a favorite favorite topic of mine. You still have uh, like three minutes. Three minutes. OK, <laughs> well, go ahead. Go ahead yeah. <laughs> OK, great. So uh, well, I mentioned scalability already, and and we we see see a lot of issues with uh, let's say attackers attacking the people using the machines and not the machines themselves because the machines might be very well protected but the people are not because they're essentially just people and have all the software flaws of of cavemen and ancient Egyptians or whatever because we haven't really changed in the last few thousand years very much so. The quirks we have are pretty well known to the attackers and uh, w what I'm worried about in the future is that, that a lot of this work that is being done by actual people one-on-one -on -one right now scamming and, and communicating and, and messaging them will be done by ever increasingly sophisticated bots that are being controlled by machine learning based models like GPT-3 and OpenAI and, and such that are actually already pretty good. So we're starting, we're going through, uh, let's say, three or four different technological tracks that are, are all, each developing towards the goal of creating more convincing models for human interaction online. And uh, so, let's say synthetic human interaction online and there's a there's a clear business case for this for example for tech support and and other things but there's also a clear criminal case for it when it comes to scamming so i think we'll we'll see a lot of that stuff especially in social media where there's already a very significant problem with bots that the social media companies are not in my opinion doing enough to solve so that's only going to get a lot worse I think here I would just highlight that, you know, while ransomware and supply chain seem to be the bigger topics we think about, it's things like the social engineering, whether it's phishing or business email compromise that are actually still more costly and, you know, are just these traditional ways that we've had with us for a long time where, you know, don't click this email, but it still racks in more money every year than something like ransomware, although ransomware is, you know, is getting up there now. Um, and so, you know, phishing as a service is something we highlighted in our, our last report from the Threat Intel team. and um, you know, this is just a way that it allows people that don't maybe aren't as sophisticated technically to purchase the support they need in the cybercrime underground to do phishing attacks on victims. Um, we've also seen this now growing in the business's email compromise side, and people are also starting to learn now about 
exploit as a service. And so without going to detail about all of these different things, I mean, essentially how it works is it allows, you know, teams or gangs, if you want to call them, to focus on maybe the part they do the best. So that can be harvesting data on LinkedIn to help with targeting a company or employees. And then they can sell that data to somebody who's good at, you know, making a proof of concept of how to exploit a vulnerability. And, you know, then they can package this stuff together uh, at what they do the best to then help a, you know, a, a legal customer or a customer on how to attack someone they want to. Um, so just to highlight that, you know, these, these things are still very much with us and, you know, very important that you put the right practices in place in terms of your employees having the knowledge not to click things they shouldn't or open attachments they shouldn't. And um, yeah, happy to hand it over from there. Mm. Yeah, I, uh, I actually added the, the, the artificial intelligence part here when I was, was thinking thinking the kind of the scaling access, as, as you guys already mentioned. Um, I believe that, that um, the artificial intelligence helps. Well, there's multiple things when it comes to cybersecurity of artificial intelligence. That's, of course, how we protect those systems and how, how those can improve the, the, the defense with an, mainly on the anomaly detection side. Uh, but based on my understanding and studies studies for my PhD, I, 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 uh, I believe that the frauding and especially kind of scaling the, the fraud uh, and and the particularly in the beginning of the of the scale how to how to kind of um, target as many people as possible and then switch to the human operators here uh, when the things get more complicated I think that is the, the, the kind of main thing that the artificial intelligence here here brings for this social engineering yeah uh, I think that's that's a intermediary step until we can see that the bots are doing the whole scamming from beginning to end because mm. I, I think at some point the the models will be sophisticated enough so that they can hold together a whole romance online using text and possibly voice synthesis mm. because yeah we already already see these these reactive models where you can have a sort of a discussion with them and with with natural lang language decoding and understanding and with with convincing voice synthesis it's possible to have a have a discussion it's it's slow now because it takes takes a lot of computing power to come up with the answers so there are delays but those delays will get smaller and this technology will be available because it, it's available to game developers now so it's going to be available to scammers in a few years yeah and i i agree on that and and uh, it's getting kind of more and more um so to say, realistic all the time, but I still believe that for certain time there needs to be a human operator kind of overseeing army of bots. But hey, let's talk quickly that that what we can do for these, and then we switch switch to the questions part that the audience should now drop if you still have any. We have a couple there. Well, I think you know the the number one thing you know coming from a, a, a phishing or BEC perspective is, you know, employee security awareness. And then, you know, it can highlight just, you know, things we do ourselves, like testing our own employees to see if they click certain things. And I think, you know, that's that's probably a pretty easy step that, that most companies can do. Um, and then there's things like, you know, disabling macros and all these different things that you can now do within your email provider to ensure that, you know, you, you're flagged if it's an external sender or if there's an attachment there. Um, so, you know, this just requires your IT staff to, you know, to go through those things and, and put those best, best practices in place. And, you know, maybe once in a while you, you miss an attachment you would have got from a friend or something. But, you know, the, that's a, there's a much bigger um, reward there if you don't enable those things. Yeah, I think protecting yourself or your company against phishing is, is basically impossible to do perfectly. And the, the best thing you can do is, is to set up two-factor authentication and, and the better, better you can do that, mm -hmm. or the faster you can do that, the better. And I think the future will be in, in some kind of physical tokens because the one-time codes can be fished also, and we've seen an increase in that. And the uptick of, of SMS or, or authenticator app-based uh, to, to FA uh, will just increase 
the phishing attacks against them. But uh, yeah, I really I, like this, like YubiKeys and, and physical tokens that are, are next to impossible to fish. But uh, that's mm -hmm. of course, yeah. Yeah, I agree. And it's not, and it's not just enough to make something like multi-factor authentication, like voluntary for your staff, because, you know, these sophisticated actors, they only need to get into a couple of accounts, you know, to get what they need. So, you know, if you're just yeah. protecting your highest level employees or just those that have the patience to do it, it's, you know, that's not the way to go about it. It's, you know, this is what we're doing now as a company and, you know, put in whatever training you have to, to make that a reality. It's, it's not so hard now because most, most email providers support things like that already. Yeah, it's like if you're going out to sea, it doesn't help that you patch half the holes in the boat. So you have to have to get a good coverage on that. That's absolutely true. That they they will they will find the account that yeah. isn't protected. And and we often see that in in real life cases that there are systems that are are in the margins that are being forgotten. That oh, oh right, yeah, we have that server over there, and 2FA isn't enabled there, and the attackers are able to first get credentials and then find a place to log in. And even though they have 90% coverage for 2FA, that it's that 10% that's the problem. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to these bots and the, and the future ro robot-driven hellscape that we're quickly going towards, and I just, <laughs> my, my only suggestion is get, get offline more, just because <laughs> People get get uh, extremely online sometimes, and it's it's hard to tell the difference when you're being manipulated by an army of bots, and the the billion dollar al algorithms on social media, and and just those will have an effect on everybody. And so meet that, people in real life. Uh, it's time for yeah. us to move the question, and and since the first question is basically almost what you just covered, not the go out part, but but the before that, uh, let's. I will keep the same slide here. So, so if you really briefly in one minute uh, summarize that why why the phishing is so successful and and what are the top things that I can do to prepare my employees for potential phishing attacks. You max start. Yeah, well, I think, uh, it's, you know, don't just assume that everybody has the same cybersecurity awareness. And I think, you know, even when we're talking here, obviously we're coming from a standpoint that we work with this every day. Um, so that's why, you know, employee employee training can be, can be very relevant. And uh, I think that might be number one. It's just how to recognize what phishing is. Um, you know, like I, you know, I can just remember myself, you know, my grandparents get a letter in the mail or they get a, a text or whatever. And it's to me, you know, it's phishing immediately. I know you know, I don't even have to read more than a sentence, but but they don't. It's very new for them. It's very interesting. It's, you know, never seen something like this before. So, you know, you have to just assume everybody's not at the same starting point as you. And I mean, that goes through, I mean, most things in, in work life, but uh, especially here with fishing. Hmm. Yeah, I think the training training is, is one part and it's it's good to have these these programs like like Hox Hunt or others that, that train your personnel to... No, noticing phishing, but uh, I think we we will never reach 100% coverage with training alone. That's that's an impossible goal. Maybe if you have a company of two people, then you might reach it temporarily. But we've seen cybersecurity professionals routinely fall into phishing attacks. So even the people who think about phishing all the time get phished. So uh, it's it's that, that's a non-starter. So I think. Uh, privileged access management for for high value accounts mm -hmm. and, and two factor authentication everywhere and just technical controls and then uh, different kinds of security products to detect illegitimate uses so that's it's a whole rich tapestry of of different solutions so there's just no no silver bullet for this yeah we are reaching to the end of the, the session, uh, really quickly one uh, question if you're unable to answer that. I have heard that APT is, uh, if APT really wants to target my business, there's a little I can do to stop them. Is that true? Uh, well, it's, it's really pessimistic to say yes, but it's always a question of resources. If the attacker has infinite resources and infinite patience and infinite time, uh, well, and you don't, then the one who has more resources will win. 
So if we keep piling attackers and let's take nation state budget into it and and let's say a professional cater of uh, 200 hackers all just sleeping and eating and thinking about compromising your company, it's really hard for me as a security professional to sh say that you have to buy our blinking box and that won't happen. So there are too many ways in and that's that's true but 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 it's it's only true in a sense because if you put enough resources into your cyber defenses then that will deter enough attackers to make your business safe yeah. and yeah. those situations where where an actual apt like a state-sponsored hacker wants to get into your company that's actually really rare it's usually just these ransomware attackers and common criminals and you can set yourself up in such a cybersecurity posture that that's well it's not impossible even then but at, at least a lot harder than the next company over yeah so just to summarize uh it's if someone really really wants to get in it's it's impossible almost impossible but but you can make it really expensive for the for the threat actor and, and then of course most likely the threat actor will find other means to achieve that yeah and if you if you understand your threat landscape then then maybe it means you could be prepared for that or at least you know you might anticipate it so you know if today you're about to open a new business in the ukraine you know, maybe there's some things you should think about right so whether that's your own security team providing some advice or you know something like one of our teams that can go yeah. some way as well yes uh hey uh now we have spent the time that was reserved for this we can continue the discussion in the uh, face to face when we meet meet with people or, or you can always contact contact us here is here is our contact details uh, for more discussion at this point i want to thank everyone who was listening this online and of course uh, on the stream streaming this this later on and wish you a nice and happy rest of the day thank, thank you. you thank you everybody